the wait a moment. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, uh, all the uh, PhD students, and welcome back. So uh, today still, uh, it, this is a third lecture from uh, Dennis Tim and Dennis uh, uh, Zastavani, uh, who is from um, uh, University uh, uh, of uh, uh, University uh, University of uh, Leuven. And uh, right now, recently, we have a collaboration between uh, the two uh, teams. And, and actually, we'll kick off the research based on the graphic statics and focus on the timber structure, uh, which is actually have a very special material performance and materiality. So the this is the third lecture, and uh, which is about um, uh, which will address the fundamentals of uh, timber design, and which will also relates to our uh, joint research uh, project. So lecture starts uh, by introducing. The, the main char characteristic of timber in buildings and outlines the conclusions to draw for the designing with timber. And the, the timber behavior actually um, uh, is very special, especially in, in the future few years, not only in Europe, but also in China, where I think about it, which is the uh, decarbonization uh, process in the building industry. And the, the timber behavior is really special in, in fire, uh, in, in, in types of construction, the connection with timber, which will be reviewed uh, today. So an analysis of the characteristic of the suitable uh, structure uh, system uh, will then be presented and uh, uh, supplemented by the presentation of some relevant examples. So the design of efficient timber structure will be then uh, addressed with the computational two uh, vector-based uh, graphic statics VGS, which uh, um, a Dennis team introduced last time. And also we, we put forward on the various of structure models and also the tree branching uh, structure system, the fan lack structures, lattice uh, riders, and also CLT plan and the folder structures will be uh, uh, mentioned as well. And for each, the graphic statics uh, interactive models will be shown and the structure explorations with the timber will then present it and showing the performance of primary structure and uh, the different joints, elucidating uh, the interest and the power of VGS as a tool for the controlled informed design of timber structures. So today's topic, back to fundamentals, which is the, the series of lectures and uh, uh, which is based on the performance-based research and topic. And uh, the VGS is really special from Dennis' team. So let's welcome uh, uh, Dennis uh, Zastavani uh, gave the lecture tonight. Thank you, Dennis, for your third lecture. Welcome. So thank you, Philip, for this kind introduction. Good evening to you all. I'm glad to be with you for this third and last uh, lecture for this series that uh, Philip mentioned as Back to Fundamentals, dedicated to structural design. And the topic of my talk today, this evening, will be timber design. As you will see, timber uh, design with timber uh, or timber design is quite a technical topic. And so this lecture will frequently be more theoretical and we'll be discussing architecture as well as structure around uh, this. So let's start with an overview of the topics we will be discussing today, and I will be sharing the screen. So let's do with this. Normally, you are seeing my screen, right? Good. We can see everything. Good. OK, so perfect. Uh, starting the presentation, and let's start with this. So, uh, as I mentioned, um, timber has a quite uncommon uh, behavior, and we'll see that it is very specific characteristic compared to other kind of structure. And so the topic today will be first having a look on historical benchmarks, since this is in all countries in Europe, very important to understand what has been done before and where we are coming from to decide where we want to go from there. And then we will uh, have a look on several topics that are timber anatomy uh, and the related property that will be coming from this. 
uh, the strategy for design uh, considering fire and resistance of timber against this strategies of design about uh, water and durability of construction then having a look on uh, design strategy according to mechanical resistance and then design strategy about using timber product from then we will see a series of examples uh, in traditional timber architecture in timber bridges in contemporary timber architecture and in CLT uh, building. Then going to a more uh, structural topics, um, reviewing timber joint, uh, high rise building, just giving an introduction, introduction since this is a quite complex topic. Having a look on a structural system, among which uh, this is the list that uh, Philippe Yuan just introduced. Arches, underslung system, tree branching system, phalanx system, trusses, lattice timber structure, and so on. To finish with corbel and um, bending uh, or shear slabs with CLT panel. Then I will give uh, giving the word and the screen to my colleague uh, Sylvain Rasner that will be presenting a series of uh, examples using VGS. Uh, connected to why I just explain as a structural system. And that will be the topic for today. We'll keep some time for question and we get a small break in about one hour. So let's start with this. And let's start with uh, first with some historical uh, benchmark. When you are discussing uh, timber, uh, this is one of the oldest material uh, used by man for construction. And you see frequently, this very uh, simple primitive architecture that is put forward with uh, timber. And what's uh, kind of uh, interesting is that uh, in our manual, uh, coming from this, we come quickly with uh, Chinese architecture, with uh, one of the older uh, uh, structural arrangements uh, with uh, timber, and with China putting forward uh, this uh, uh, roof with uh, quite steep uh, slope, as uh, being something constitutive, uh, all the building being uh, built with timber and only the basis with other materials as bricks, uh, clay bricks and masonry. In China, you have also what has been for a long time the highest uh, timber building with the pagoda of uh, Fa Gong. And uh, there's a counterpart in the Japanese culture being the pagoda of uh, Ho Yu Ji. Uh, this one being one of the oldest that have, have been kept in uh, its current state. But, you know, in the Japanese culture, there's a way of uh, always rebuilding uh, the construction to maintain them instead of conserving, maintaining in, in the current state. Uh, we have also kind of a counterpart in Europe, for instance, with Norway timber architecture, with the staff Kirk, uh, staff uh, staff Kirk in uh, Norway, or staff Church in our language coming from the Middle Age, and going to other culture, we can find also in Russia, kind of very huge construction made by uh, with timber, with also palace of that time. Uh, going back to Europe, if you are seeking the the, the track of uh, old timber construction, you can go uh, in old Ireland, in the Palace of Persepolis, in which you had a huge construction of more than 400 meter length with the huge, uh, huge um, uh, palace room, as you can see here, with uh, stone columns supporting a timber construction. And these are not uh, huge beams. So the span is about uh, five to six meters in this case, and uh, not uh, being a huge beam, but a composed beam. So that's very interesting to have a look onto, onto this. And this enable a new uh, way to make architecture to raise from that time, since if you compare with uh, things that are appearing in, in Egypt, for instance, you have not that huge span, and so the look of the plan of architecture are totally different. If you go to Greece, that is uh, supposed to be a reference since their stone temple are supposed to be a translation of timber temple in the, the, the way they are looked. If you are looking to this, you will see that indeed you can find uh, traces of what could be the, the end of the piece of 
timber on uh, some place uh, of the, the building. And if you go into the technical uh, construction, you can see that's a kind of pile, a superimposition of uh, several uh, timber element. And as you can see, it just put on the precedent one without a complex arrangement in terms of structural design. For this, we will need to wait for uh, the Roman Empire. So we are here around the fifth century and seeing the first um, timber frameworks appearing in which we have uh, collaborative work in between uh, compression bars uh, and tension bars with a specific question arising from this does a question of the joints, the connection between bars. And if you are looking carefully to this, you see that the, the geometry of this connection is designed to develop certain kind of transfer of forces. So if you are pushing here at the head of this structure, you see that the way that uh, the notches are made into the, the central uh, piece of timber with transmit forces in compression. And that this connection are studied also in that way at the basis of the structure. You need specific uh, arrangement for a specific uh, joint also, and sometime appearing the tension connection with timber that is managed here with um, steel, not steel, but iron uh, ties uh, or iron kind of boards in that case. You will see the system evolving along time, for instance, in this building, in which you see the interplays of a structure you know already since we have studied it in the first lecture uh, about graphic statics was an interplay of uh, compression bars and tension bars is a system of what will become later trusses. And so that's very interesting for this. Asking in the same way about studying carefully what will be the look uh, the appearance, the arrangement of the connection you have between all this uh, member. So uh, if you are going back to other uh, system like timber, we are here in the, before the Middle Age, about uh, 600, uh, 800, uh, so the seventh or ninth uh, century, we will see again the system of pile up uh, appearing for timber construction and change will, will come later in the Middle Age. As you can see in the Middle Age, there are first more and more complex systems appearing with timber construction. With this example that are put forward by Violet Le Duc, that wrote a series of books uh, about the medieval architecture. And what's very interesting to see is that if you are looking uh, to what were the bridges at that time, you see very, very efficient system that are quite connected to what we have seen before as timber from ropes from the roof or from Romans. You can see also kind of funicular structure appearing here and uh, the system being that efficient that, so we are in the Middle Age, if you are coming back to 300 years later in Switzerland, for instance, you will see exactly the same kind of structure appearing in timber bridges. So uh, if we want to design uh, something that could be uh, innovative, we have to keep in mind all this funding that have been made a long time. If you are going to the way that uh, construction were made with timber in Europe, in the Middle Ages, and more protect, particularly this is in France, you can see the system developing developed from the fifth century uh, in France as being the half timbering. In French, we have a very nice name for this. Uh, that's the name of colombage. That is a reference to a small construction that was made for a bird that is named Colomb. Uh, so anyway, but you can see here this uh, structural arrangement that is made with massive timber connection. And also the invention of what will be a later called bracing in this typical uh, look of architecture. You will see the quite complex uh, timber arrangement with the notion of 
contact zone appearing uh, more precisely and this kind of construction and of course discussing today to digital fabrication with convey this question of contact joints uh, more uh, intensively. Uh, of course, you can see quite complex arrangement appearing with uh, kind of uh, farms uh, building also that uh, drive to very efficient arrangement. And the next uh, step of this story is uh, going uh, back to uh, this kind of the industrial development in uh, America and more specifically with the balloon frame system that has been designed as one of first industrial uh, timber structure with what is called, as I mentioned, the balloon frame uh, system, also called the Chicago construction uh, system, in which you see uh, very little material compared to the middle edge that will be used for vertical bearing element, but quite repetitive. And a question of bracing that will be managed with uh, some diagonal here, but most of the time you, you can use uh, also the cladding with an angle of close to uh, 45, 60 degrees uh, to develop a bracing and later on with the system that will be evolving towards the uh, uh, towards the uh, platform frame, uh, these uh, bracing with most of the time be uh, replaced with panels. And that's uh, still yet another way to design timber construction. With platform frame, you just have the structure corresponding to white, uh, one uh, story, one level. And they are just superimposing each other with a question of the global behavior against the horizontal forces coming from wind, wind forces. And that will drive to other development. Of course, the system won't enable you to go very high and we'll have a look on what will be the strategy that will be developed on a higher building also. So let's move from this to a timber anatomy related question and to see what would be the connected properties to this. So wood or timber is coming from nature uh, without significant transformation. That's true to a certain point, as we will see if we want to manage the issue of uh, water, for instance, or with uh, fire, uh, sometimes we will have to transfer the material by itself. So the intrinsic qualities coming from the material depend on the species of the trees that will be used, the age of the tree, the quality of the soil, the altitude and the latitude, so the position uh, horizontally and vertically around the earth, and also the treatment that will be uh, provided to the material. Since this is a material that is natural, you have a high vari variability of properties. So that is in contrast with most of the industrial products we have. And so this is why for a long time, uh, this material has been disregarded by engineer and architect in the industrial times, but also with uh, specific strategies with for instance, wood-based material as glue lam laminated wood and panels will be reinvented, uh, a new kind of architecture based on wood-based material that produced by the industry. And the last but important element are that uh, putting forward the grading of, of wood, uh, so about resistance. Uh, we have a European system that has been developed for this, looking to derived product uh, joint techniques and also digital fabrication. All this brings a new life to this uh, material, timber material. Also, as timber is a uh, natural material at the origin, you can have a possible uh, sustainable approach uh, to construction and to material, but it will depend on the treatment we will be providing to the uh, timber and we'll be discussing this in the next uh, slide.
So timber is coming from uh, the trunk. Uh, that is the only part of the structure that will be used of the timber of the tree that will be used for structure, and the rest won't be used. And if you are looking more closely to a cut and to the timber, you will see that there are several zones appearing. And if I start from the uh, beginning, you have the heart uh, of a timber that's called medulla, but then you will have the uh, hardwood, sapwood, and then an interface a layer that is called the cambium, that is the crowd zone of the trunk uh, of the tree. And actually the cambium and the layer just after that is the bast will be the only layer that are truly living. Uh, if you start from the beginning, the uh, sapwood will be quite dead. Uh, the hardwood would be quite dead. The sap would be still living, but not that much. We have still some um, um, uh, nutritive uh, uh, flow that will be uh, met into this. And after these uh, two zones, so that will be the cambium and the blast, that are the zone where the tree will be growing, you will be able to see the bark that will be the dead cell coming from the uh, protection of the timber. This is important to put forward for several reasons. First, you have annual rings that are appearing. So each year is corresponding to a ring. We will see more in detail what this means about uh, these uh, rings. And uh, also that we will see difference in terms of behavior between the center, the hardwood and the sapwood. And sometimes we will have to make different decisions about using or not the sapwood all around the uh, hard wood. And uh, I will discuss this later since this has a cost. Um, from this, we have different families of timber. We have softwood and hardwood. Softwood examples are spruce, pine, larch, douglas, fir, or cedar. Hardwood as oak or chestnut, beech, birch, locust, for instance. If you have also tropical timber, that will be used most of the time for the uh, window frame, uh, window framing. About structure, we'll be discussing most of the time about softwood uh, due to the specific property I was discussing later, and hardwood with specific connection or reinforcement as well for uh, resistance against forces uh, than for uh, fire also. Going more in detail about this, you can see that there are kind of a series of tubes that are assembled. And if you're looking from this to this, this is connect to a tree. This is corresponding to one annual ring of timber. So when uh, the winter is finished, uh, the timber will be more and more uh, living and you will have uh, growing cells appearing and that it will be slowed down again to going back to the time of uh, the winter. And uh, that will be shown with what you will see with your own eye as a ring uh, coming from one year growing of the timber. What you can see also is that you have indeed this kind of tubes and this tube will explain that the uh, behavior of timber will be quite different according uh, to the di direction you are looking to. If you are trying to put some forces in terms of tension force along this tube, and if you have no nodes in timber, this will be very uh, resistant. Uh, if you are pushing on this tube, this tube has with a tube, uh, steel tube or anything in the true scale of a building will be buckling. And so this will be limiting the resistance compression. Of course, if you have nodes appearing uh, in uh, the, uh, this anatomy, this will be limiting the resistance tension also. So differences appear due to this anatomy. If you are pushing perpendicularly to this uh, system, you are uh, 
you, you could crush uh, these tubes that will be uh, less resistant in perpendicular direction than in the longitudinal direction. And if you are uh, putting tension forces, these tension force will separate this tube quite easily, and that will be the weakest point of timber. So this uh, anatomical view on the left is connected to soft wood. If you are having a look on hard wood, you will see that the uh, anatomy of timber will be slightly different. And that will be explaining that this uh, timber will be more dense, more heavy, and would be more resisting also, but will be growing more slowly. And again, you can see this uh, annual ring of uh, growing of the tree. So from this, we learn already some, some element about the uh, behavior of timber. And indeed, if you are comparing of forces uh, uh, depending on the direction, if with bending, you can uh, have 100% of what would be the class of timber. If you have only compression, you are just at 85, 90% of this resistance that is shown with the blue arrow. If you go to tension and traction uh, along fiber, you can see that uh, the resistance will be limited to about 60%. And this is due to presence of nodes into timber. But if you are perfect timber, you can have up to uh, two and a half the resistance you have in compression. So this arrows are in scale showing what would be along the fiber, the respective um, compression or tension resistance you can deploy on this material. Of course, if you are going to press perpendicularly uh, to the timber, you see you just have 10% of resistance. And with tension, it's just a little 2% resistance that would be the weakest point of timber. And that will drive to specific uh, attention to a uh, structural problem. Um, if you are going to more in detail in the anatomy, you see that there are several components of timber with cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, and some extract. And this extract will be all the difference between a timber uh, species being durable or not durable, resisting to a, to a fungi and to a wood bearing beetles or not. Uh, and that will be explaining also that you have this kind of extract in the uh, hard wood uh, and not in the uh, soft uh, wood. Um, from then, going more in detail, you see that Timber is composed with carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen with some uh, nitrogen. And carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are uh, translating what will be the constitutive material in timber with uh, carbon and water. And also would explain why you will have a molecular uh, anatomy that will be close to what we have in other fuel uh, materials. What is to be put forward also is that uh, in this you have O, uh, H2O that will appearing as water composition, but also water that will be more or less free into timber and that will represent a true problem. Um, so as a summary up to here, uh, we have uh, several components and with carbon and oxygen uh, and hydrogen, we'll see that timber will be a kind of natural polymer. So the kind of plastic that will be interesting since you can associate a true plastic to this natural uh, polymer. And we have also fiber that will be hollow and that will be transporting sap and uh, nutrient that could be a problem against the uh, durability of the timber. Uh, we can see that uh, depending on the family you are belonging to between softwood, hardwoods of uh, tropical uh, timber, we will have uh, different uses. And most of the time, some softwood will be lighter, would be uh, quite resistant and will be uh, 
preferably used for structures. So framing, uh, trusses, and so on will be made most of the time with softwood. Hardwood are uh, harder and uh, very heavier. So most of the time you will be using for this for furniture and stairs, but also with uh, local reinforcement in uh, structure made of soft wood. If you are looking to uh, the structure of a very old and resisting building, hard wood will be used in uh, the uh, timber frameworks of cathedral, for instance, and more particularly, as we will see, it will be chestnut that will be chosen in that time. So most of the time, we'll have to deal with soft wood with structural uh, system. So what about uh, the design strategy that will be connected to fire and resistance to fire? Um, if you are having a look on what is the chemical uh, composition of uh, timber, you are taking CO2, so carbon, uh, global warming uh, material, associating with timber, you are putting some energy in a form of light to associate uh, this to a kind of sugar, uh, glucose, uh, as C6H2O6, that is quite a formula that is good for wood for a timber. And this will produce also oxygen. And this is why um, you can say that timber is the lung of the planet since it produces oxygen uh, when associated uh, CO2 and water. This principle is named the vegetal photosynthesis and is a chemical reaction that needs energy. And the energy will be provided in a form of light. If you are going into the night, uh, you will see that every trees of uh, plant will be uh, bracing as we do, and will be using a structure to be associating to oxygen and producing the reverse uh, reaction, producing CO2 and H2O. If you are making the balance into it, uh, this reaction during the day will be more important than the reaction during the night. Uh, and you can see that also that's a very important aspect that uh, timber is using CO2 to be built. If you are having a look on biological attack as fungi of wood boring beetles, you will see that they will take uh, wood is the general form associating to oxygen as they are breathing and they are eating it to produce and to release again, CO2 and H2O and produce energy that this uh, fungi or beetle will be using for their own growing. There's another kind of a similar reaction is that when you are uh, having fire, this is exactly the same equation that we have seen with a uh, biological attack. And the energy that will be released will be the energy uh, that will be using for heating system. And this is why this is called of exothermic equation in which you are uh, this time uh, releasing energy. So uh, wood is a combustible material and a flammable uh, material due to its anatomical composition and due to the fact that at the end, the global energy uh, producing would be positive. But if we look more in detail into this is not that easy. Uh, first, indeed, comparing wood to other fuel material, you can see that the structure is quite uh, simple, uh, quite similar. You see here wood appearing, and you see here coal, uh, anthracite, and gases without the oxygen yet. And this full uh, burning of timber would produce in between 19,000 and 21,000 kilojoule uh, energy per kilo of wood. Now, uh, to put some fire into timber, you need some specific condition. You need a combustible material, and timber is that kind of material. You will need a oxidizing agent as oxygen, for instance, but you have oxygen all around us. And then you need a third condition that is to be providing some energy to the system. 
And the energy can be produced as fire as, or the temperature uh, that could be uh, uh, provided to the system. So more precisely, you have flames uh, that will be put on timber or you will have a temperature that will be high enough to put this timber in fire. We'll be answering this question of the temperature in just one moment. So for having uh, timber burning, and this is the case in a building also, you will need uh, fuel, oxidizer, and also the energy that has been to put uh, to the material as in the form of flame or as temperature. Uh, if you're looking to the curve of the rays of temperature in a building that will be burning, you will see that uh, you need to put some energy in the system up to a certain temperature. And that won't be the timber uh, or wood that will be burning first. It will be papers and all the tissue that could be uh, burned first. And as soon as we be reaching a temperature, that temperature area will define at 400 degrees. Celsius, uh, all uh, that would be in timber, we start to burn. So in the phenomenon of um, a fire in the building, uh, as soon as the temperature raises enough to reach this 400 degree, you will have the time of the flashover. So it will be the generalized flaming of the building. And then the temperature could rise quite uh, heavily to reach uh, 1,200, 200, uh, 1,300 degrees uh, Celsius degrees for this temperature. And then when we have no uh, things to burn, temperature will slowly goes down and stop uh, with this. So if you want to ignite, uh, put fire uh, to timber quite quickly, you need a temperature of 400 degrees if you want to do it quite quickly. And uh, if so for this, uh, you don't need to have flames. Uh, it means that as soon as you have 400 degrees temperature in a building, everything that would be in timber, this start to burn, even if there are no flames uh, going to it. If you have more time, you can uh, put some fire at the temperature of 400 degrees. If you have uh, a long uh, uh, time to put this fire on timber, and also if you have flames that will be put on the material. And even with a lower temperature, but it will take a long time. So keep in mind 400 degrees if you want to put fire in the quite short terms. If you are looking to the raise of temperature into timber, you will see the temperature will be raising and uh, having a step uh, here in which temperature is maintained to 100 degrees. It's a temperature in which the water that is part of the timber will be boiling and uh, going to gases. And from that time, the temperature could raise. And this shows that water will have an important role to play uh, against fire in several forms. We won't recommend to use uh, wet uh, timber, but uh, since it will be drying in any case, but material containing a certain amount of water would be uh, very useful for this. Uh, going more in detail, you will see that I mentioned that you need to provide some temperature or energy. So before uh, that, uh, we raise the temperature of 300, 400 degrees, you need to put some energy. And so there's a question that's the reason why timber is not flaming alone. Uh, you need to put some energy to a certain temperature to get an exothermic temperature. When this is done, something very interesting is that uh, the timber would be burning and will be uh, producing coal. And this coal will be uh, met all around the uh, timber uh, material. And also we'll see that due to very specific properties as well of timber and with uh, this coal, the temperature inside this, um, this material will be maintained uh, quite low. Here you see with the timber burning of more than uh, 400, 500 degrees, it could be 1,000 degrees. The center of the section will just be, in this case, 32 degrees Celsius. So it means that this timber will be maintained with all its properties. Uh, and this is maybe one of the only material that can have 
uh, these properties. And that's very interesting. Since the other material will be changed with temperature, but the inner part of the timber won't be changed. And that is why uh, timber could be a very interesting material against fire, even if this is a material that can be uh, burning. And the other fact is that the speed in which we have this coal being formed on timber can be precisely defined. So you can just calculate the remaining section into it, uh, depending on this uh, speed of uh, burning rate. And you are able to calculate very uh, easily uh, what could be the performance in time to uh, of timber uh, against uh, fire and against loading. And that's not that easy with uh, steel, for instance, or with uh, concrete, for instance. So you need to, uh, you will have a, a burning uh, uh, peripheral zone, and this will be reducing the load capacity, and you need to oversize, and the burning rate will be in between uh, 0.6 and 1 millimeter per minute. So uh, providing some centimeter protection will be guaranteeing that the system will be resisting uh, fire. What I mentioned is that uh, if you are comparing the heat transfer coefficient of wood or timber here being 0 0.15 watt per uh, meter and uh, Kelvin degrees, you will see that this is less, far less than concrete, steel or clay bricks. Uh, so that the wood itself won't transmit uh, the heat that easily, but as soon as this uh, timber has been turned to charcoal, we have such a low coefficient that will be below the limit in which we have uh, insulation material that will be appearing. So typically, uh, insulation material have this heat transfer coefficient of 0 0.040 uh, watt, watt per meter uh, Kelvin degrees and timber will be below. Of course, this charcoal will be cracked and will be sometimes damaged, but this show that uh, timber is protecting it himself with uh, the production of charcoal. And that's the explanation why the temperature can be maintained quite low inside the uh, system in itself. Looking to the uh, burning rate and the time you need uh, to put some timber in flame, you will see a very uh, obvious mechanism in which the, the density being uh, higher, the more time you will need to flame timber and the less uh, will be the combustion rate of the timber. So uh, we will see that uh, choosing, choosing um, heaviest uh, timber element will uh, guarantee that it will be resisting uh, better and better again fire uh, in supplement to the protection uh, mechanisms that uh, timber have against uh, construction. And so you have a typical uh, rates. You will see that lighter material as uh, plywood and uh, wood panel uh, based. Uh, wood-based panel uh, would have uh, higher uh, transmission, uh, higher uh, progression uh, of fire coefficient. And if you have solid soft wood also, you will see that this will be less for uh, soft wood and yet less for hard wood heat. We'll see also difference between solid timber and glue lamp timber, since glue lamp seems to be better against fire, and this can be explained quite easily uh, with the parameter of uh, these burning rates. And one of these parameters is you will be comparing the surface and the volume. And the most is this proportion between surface and volume will be. The uh, easiest would be to start combustion and, and uh, flame to be spread. So the objective would be to have less crack. And you know that when uh, timber will be uh, drying, you will crack appearing. Uh, that won't appear most of the time in glue lamp. And also in glue lamp, you will be removing all the cracks and so on. And so for good resisting to fire, you need massive section uh, of timber. Uh, with no difference, it will be uh, 
uh, blue lamb or massive timber, even if this behavior would be better for a blue lamb. So you uh, keep in mind it was the question of the proportion between surface and the volume. And the easiest way to protect timber is just to withdraw surface to the uh, presence of fire. So you can using uh, this by uh, using uh, panels uh, made of lime, for instance. You can use specific paint for this, or you can include the timber into other uh, component of the architecture to uh, be protecting a timber against uh, fire. Uh, you will see that there are several steps. Actually, the timber does not burn itself, it will be decomposed in several products. And depending on the temperature that will be uh, uh, met for uh, this timber, this decomposition product will be more or less flammable. And this is uh, why you need a first process in decomposing wood with energy to put uh, to release this material that will be able to um, uh, enter into burning step. So a uh, third parameter to put for wood, uh, the type of wood, uh, you know that indeed uh, putting some log, uh, timber log won't be that easy, but uh, putting some uh, small piece of uh, light uh, timber uh, would be easy to do. So the type of wood, the section of the element, the moisture content of wood and possible protection of the surplus will be a governing parameter to take into account. What's about connection? Uh, if you are looking to what's happened to steel that is used for connection in timber, at the temperature of 400 degrees, you will see that uh, there's a loss of properties of about 40% in steel. And that's a true issue for me on timber since uh, when you will be losing that much properties of steel when the when, when at the temperature where the, the timber is just starting to burn uh, you will have uh, the uh, steel that is just disappearing and totally disappearing with all the building has been put in fire and so that's a true problem and sometimes you need to multiply uh, the number of, of connection rods you will be putting in timber. And also this can be uh, the factor that will be giving the dimension of your member. You need more uh, place into your member to put some more doubles or uh, bolts into it. And so what will be governing the dimensioning of the system won't be the resistance against fire of the member itself, but the resistance of the connection. So uh, each connection being used uh, with steel needs a specific attention to this. There are some formula here that will be showing that at the temperature of 40 degrees, uh, you will have lost of 42% of the strength properties and a loss of almost 30% of the um, elasticity, so the deformation of the system with steel. So did show that uh, timber against other material as steel, for instance, with steel structure, uh, timber have advantage and indeed that this uh, steel will be the weak points of uh, construction against a fire. Um, I have to put for wood that uh, depending of the temperature, uh, in the first state, you remember that the temperature, temperature in timber was raised up to 100 degrees. You have also a loss of properties in timber itself, but you know that these 100 degrees are not met all uh, inside the uh, structural member itself. But you see that indeed, as soon as timber dries, it loses also a part of its properties, as well of uh, traction, only 10%, but compression is suffering more about uh, this uh, loss of water into timber. So I mentioned about this uh, speed of uh, progressing uh, limit of the cold zone around timber burning. 
And uh, as you know this, you are able to calculate what will be appearing uh, as a resulting uh, geometry of a member when you have fire. And indeed, uh, the stake will be to have less possible surface of timber. And if you are to make the choice of very uh, complex geometry with a lot of surface, that's very really nice to see, but it's a disadvantage against fire. So what could be the summary about the design strategy against fire? So uh, fire in timber, in timber can be easily controlled. You can oversize section using this uh, beta coefficient that I showed just before. You have to reduce the exposed surface or choosing for most massive uh, section and you can protect this timber with material having a high water content as uh, uh, lime, for instance. Uh, if you have steel connecting roads, you have to choose the less massive steel elements since they are uh, driving, uh, conducting heat into it. So you have to choose dowels or need instead of uh, boards, for instance, as connector. Uh, if you want to protect locally and you can protect the steel connecting road, for instance, if there are no head as uh, boards, but if you are using doors, you can protect timber using hardwood, for instance, for local protection. Uh, you can try to use timber to timber contact joint. Uh, on that case, you won't have to suffer uh, what's happening to timber. And you have also fire retail and product that can be used on timber. Uh, since it will be changing the uh, chemical reaction, but it will turn uh, your natural material to a material that won't be uh, that natural and that could be a problem uh, at the stage of the end of life, and that's for sustainability. What now about uh, design strategy against water and the durability in timber? So you know this equation, if you are looking to this, you see that indeed timber is a long file of carbon uh, associated with others. And you have kind of a limit that will be either OH or H. And uh, there will be a natural uh, connecting uh, uh, junction that will be between water and within and between a timber so we'll have a water that will be uh, attached with a low uh, um, force uh, connection and that is meaning that some of the part of the water that will be coming to timber will be changing the molecular composition and from then uh, the volume of the molecule will be changed and that's a problem against timber so we have cut off of this uh, long series of uh, polymers. So it's a glucose polymer, a sugar polymer. And we'll see that you have kind of uh, lines of uh, polymer up to uh, 3,000 or even 10,000 uh, molecular units that would be associated to uh, do the um, nature of uh, timber itself. Uh, what about water? Uh, we know that we have tube and there could be water in the tube. We know that uh, this uh, uh, chemical um, um, composition timber can attract water also. And you have water that has been used to build the timber in itself. So water is material of, full of water. Timber is a lot, uh, have a lot of water into it. And depending on the fresh uh, cut timber or even a living timber, you can have up to 600% water into timber. Uh, if you are going to go inside a building, you will see that the equilibrium is around 12% timber. So you have to uh, moving uh, this water outside of timber, since indeed uh, you will have a connection of the question of water with uh, the fungi and also the beetle that will be attacking timber. The third end of this water, this free water, is just the water that is running into the tube of uh, timber. And as soon as you cut the timber and you put it vertically, you will see this water just flowing down from this tube. And so it can be uh, eliminated very easily. 
uh, if you are uh, going more in detail with the remaining water, you have the bone water into a timber. And something that's very uh, positive is that if you maintain timber is so low uh, in a, how to say this, in an environment, in an environment in which we have low uh, moisture, uh, you have low water into the air. Uh, this uh, the timber will be uh, balancing uh, the natural equilibrium of, of water and will be releasing this water, so you can dry naturally a part of this timber. The fact is that it will be uh, uh, swelling uh, radially and tangentially, uh, and that could be an issue that we'll be discussing just after. And combined water into timber itself won't be released uh, if you are not uh, burning the timber, so we don't have to take care of this content of water. What would be this uh, variation of dimension? Timber is uh, not reacting to heat for uh, dimension, as concrete or uh, steel will do, but will be uh, changing dimension according to uh, the level of moisture in the air. And as you can see, uh, this uh, change of dimension will be more uh, co uh, connected to this radial or or tangential uh, dimension. I show this since this will be defining the way that a uh, cutting part will be reacting. Uh, if we have this kind of section will be impacted by radial. If we have this kind of section in the other direction, it will be impacted due to the tangential uh, dimension. And you see that if you have one unit of deformation in the longitudinal direction, we have 10 in the radial direction and 20 in the tangential direction. So that could be a true issue, and indeed this rate of changing is about uh, around uh, three, four, uh, zero, three to uh, zero, four percent variation of dimension for one degrees, one percent variation in the moisture of the air. So it means that uh, when you have uh, internal uh, uh, level of 30% of moisture in the air going in the summer, for instance, and going as high as 20 uh, in the winter, for instance, you gain uh, 30% uh, percent, uh, in the air moisture. And in timber, you have a change of about 6% uh, moisture in the timber itself. And if you are multiplying uh, this variation of 12 minus 6, giving 6 by zero for percent you have a change of dimension of about 24 millimeter by meter so if you have a timber plank that are put on the ground uh, to protect it uh, between the winter and the summer you have two and a half centimeter difference uh, of dimension and so if you don't take care of this you have two problems about the behavior of timber Anyway, but this problem also appearing in structure, you know that timber is drying with time. Uh, this drying will uh, 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 produce crack into timber and this crack indeed uh, will uh, change the uh, mechanical properties of the section. If you are cutting this with some specific uh, uh, cutting, um, into the section, this will be controlling the way that timber will be changing dimension and you are putting yourself uh, a kind of hole into it. But also this shrinkage that will be linked to a timber will uh, drive some specific problem at joint connection. And this calculation that has been put forward by uh, uh, Tribulo and Calvi in 2001 show that in the case of the timber framework, the uh, dimension, uh, the change of dimension could be higher due to the uh, change of moisture compared to the deformation we'll get against uh, loadings. So the structure will be more deformed by the play of water, let's say so, than uh, by the loading by itself. And of course, if we have uh, connecting uh, 
timber to timber connection, this change of dimension will be changing the contact you have between the several elements and could drive uh, the forces uh, that could be uh, transmitted in the timber that could be very different and uh, attracting some force in some member instead of other uh, timber. Even with connection, if we have a steel plate or two different direction of timber, so these are about two different uh, direction of timber, the one being vertically and the other would be, let's say, horizontally or almost, or with the connection, we still place that won't change uh, of dimension with the temperature, it will drive a timber to change its own direction and will have cracks appearing in the joint of timber. So that's needs a specific uh, attention since this crack is appearing uh, perpendicularly in tension uh, of uh, the direction of fibers. And this is the weakest point of timber. So that's uh, indeed a point of attention for this. What about the variation? You see that there's a kind of equilibrium in timber that is connected to the most sure you have a timber. And so the idea would be that if you want to control this, you have to find the level of uh, intrinsic water that will be corresponding to the condition in which the timber will be used. And then you will be uh, lowering this uh, shrinkage uh, phenomenon appearing in timber. So classically, in uh, inside we are around twelve percent for timber uh, from a framework, for instance. And to reach this level, the question will raise if we want to dry uh, artificially using energy for this or not, since it will change the balance of uh, the um, environmental impact of your timber. So depending on the use, if you are using cladding or decking, or if you are using window frame or frameworks, or using a parquet on the ground, for instance, you will have to choose normally different uh, level of moisture into timber. What's very important to see is that fungi in wood come around 20%. And so if you have a timber wood that has been dried to a lower level of this, Fungi and uh, after uh, wood boring uh, beetle won't attack timber. So the best way to protect uh, timber against biological risk would be to dry it with the question naturally or not naturally. If you want to dry naturally timber, you won't be able to go below 18%. So that's a question you have to balance into the design. So uh, what's about the strategies? You know that water mm -hmm. is attracting a fun fungi and also wood burning beetle, uh, but also mm -hmm. that uh, water will impact the structural behavior also. So you have to make a choice. If you want to just protect your timber, you have to dry timber and that will be raise the gray energy or you can uh, use an artificial protection for timber and not drying timber, so you will have cracking appearing. And in this case, you have to put some chemical timber and it will have an influence in terms of uh, environmental damage. So, um, so, so you have to make your mind about all this. And indeed, you have also this uh, characteristic that uh, timber uh, with a sapwood won't be resisting at all. So you have to decide if you want to remove it or not. And depending on what would be and the, the hardwood in the middle, you have uh, will have resisting or not resisting at all uh, timber. And for instance, you see so the the. Uh, uh, the smallest would be the more resisting that for uh, in terms of uh, hardwood hardwood is coming is starting here to uh, here you will see that chestnut would be the best uh, resisting uh, uh, hardwood and this is the one that has been chosen to build the timber frameworks of cathedral for instance you will see also that uh, depending on the nature of timber and the fact that the sapwood and the hardwood won't be different, 
QLF uh, attack that would be running through the timber or not running through everything into the timber, that some insect attacks some kind of timber, not other. I won't go into detail about this. You have to uh, mm -hmm. keep in mind. But what's important is that I use classes, dry wood only or hotted wood that would be in seawater or with a contact with the ground or interior and so on. And you can match uh, that's just for the detail. I won't enter into this. You can match the durability class of timber that we have seen before with a class of uh, use uh, that could be um, developed in timber. And that's a way to guarantee the good standing uh, characteristic of uh, timber. You have preservative treatment, as I mentioned. So it could be metal source, it can be organic product, and could be heat treatment also, but that will be a uh, changing deeply the resistance properties or you can use other kind of chemical but you won't turn uh, your uh, natural material to uh, let's say a chemical material and that's a problem at the end you have also protective and not preservative but protective so uh, uh, protective around timber as uh, painting strains and holes but this require maintenance and that's another kind of questions uh, so next step, we'll be discussing the design strategies for mechanical resistance, and we'll, then we'll go moving to uh, the uh, um, case studies. Uh, but I suggest that maybe we can do a small break of five minutes here uh, to have some rest and drink some water of coffee, and then uh, starting back with uh, this. Okay, great. And let's, let's take a break. So let's have a break. See you in five minutes. See you. So, uh, the most of the theory has been done right now. Uh, let's move to let's move to the, uh, the question of resistance, and then we'll be uh, back to uh, some case studies. Um, There's a question of grading of timber appearing, and you have several classes that has been put for wood in any case in the European system in which I am uh, belonging. I will go, I won't go into, into detail. And as you can see, there are several properties that are known as known as, as early as you know, what should be the strength class you are belonging with your uh, timber. 
and you can see on the left, for instance, that zero is mentioning the direction of the fiber. 90 is uh, at an angle of 90 degrees uh, with the timber. K is just telling that this kind of uh, way to calculate the values that guarantee that 95% of the element will be resisting. Uh, T is for tension, C for compression, and so on. So as uh, soon as we have this grading uh, that has been put for wood, uh, that's a way to guarantee uh, the properties. Uh, you know, of course, uh, this figure I'll show you, actually, it's a little bit different since you have several uh, systems that has been uh, developed. And in the Eurocode, the reference is Hankinson, in which you have this uh, kind of uh, curve that could be uh, met, uh, for which we have uh, a loss of resistance from the uh, sense of the fiber and the sense perpendicular, perpendicular to it. And so that's a point of attention when we will be designing uh, with different uh, direction of timber. The same exists with uh, hardwood. And you see that indeed the values are very higher that you have in timber. And it, uh, and it, uh, 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 could you please uh, share a screen? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I I found it was raining also. I'm starting again with uh, this. Uh, I was, oops, sorry. So sharing the screen. This one. Okay, here we go. Please. That's okay. I'm sorry. So we start again from that point. Uh, I found it was okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, so uh, starting again from then, sorry. So I was mentioning uh, quite quickly since the time is running on that there are a grading that is proposed for several type of timber. I was mentioning about the resistance here, uh, characteristic 95% uh, percent of uh, element that uh, we are resisting, zero for the sense of the fiber, 90 for perpendicular to fiber. And I was uh, showing the laws that could be governing uh, the um, uh, resistance of timber according to the direction we, we have that could be quite lower indeed in the perpendicular direction. So I was mentioning also that, uh, of course, the level of resistance is higher for hardwood and also in between with glue lamps, since glue lamps is just um, extracting what would be the nodes of timber, a whole singularity of defect producing a better material with uh, um, material that is not that uh, efficient at the very uh, beginning. What has to be mentioned is that timber in compression in blue have a plastic uh, behavior, but almost a fragile uh, behavior in red on the cross. And if you are working on designing the structure, you have to be attentive to the capacities to redistribute forces. And even more, if you are working with plastic design, as we do, so the plastic possibility to redistribute force would be linked to uh, the properties of compression or the properties you can deploy at the place of the connection. And I will be discussing this. So in the European system, we will have ultimate state uh, design. And from this, you have uh, to guarantee the force. And you will see here for timber that you have a security factor that will be applied on timber and that, that you will have a modification that will be uh, attached to the duration of loading. So to be more precise, you can see that if we have a uh, long-standing permanent loading, the resistance of timber will be reduced to 60% of what you have in short term. And if you have instant loading, it can raise up to 110% of the resistance. So in any case, you have to take into account the fact that the uh, timber is losing its properties a long time, and this will be connected to the question of moisture again, so the question of water into timber. So it's wise we take that time to discuss this. 
so you can see here on a curve that you have a creep uh, phenomenon, so long-term additional deformation that could be 300% of the deformation that you have in the short term, depending of the variation of moisture you have on the short terms. Now, what's about design strategy using timber uh, product? Uh, the first idea is to use solid timber and properties depending on species of growth and shaping modes if you are cutting the fibers or not when we are uh, sewing or uh, uh, reworking the surface of timber. And that's uh, questions. You have also the length of the timber that could be limited. Most of the time around six meter and section could be limited also. And the fact is that we have kind of industrial produced uh, section. I don't know in China, but you will tell me about this. In Europe, you have most of the time the section that will be uh, three times, uh, two to three times higher than the width. And the American system, it can be up to 10 times. So you have to design totally differently the structure according to the fact that you will have um, instabilities that are linked to the very high section as you have produced here. Timber product as glue lamb, as uh, LVL, uh, so as for instance, uh, this Kerto panel will produce very high resistance uh, materials. And you have also the rated uh, product that could be used. Uh, or even compose section with small section that could be reassembled. Here you have the head, head of the wood that was on side that will be put on uh, after cutting in, in a cross on uh, the outer part of the system. So it was the zone where the bark was, uh, so the outer zone. We can produce a very efficient system, but this one were not always uh, uh, interesting from the uh, financial point of view, as we have massive uh, system appearing on side. New product as panels for uh, as not not panel here. We have composed system with a lot of uh, resin into it. Could have also very high properties. And you can have also panels as oriented strain board or multiplex panel that could be used to assemble your system. So what's about this? It depends on your philosophy that we'll be discussing on the, on the system you will be approaching in the other types. There's also product that could be chosen for uh, long-standing uh, holding uh, at the uh, external zone of the building, for instance, with the solid panel. And something very interesting would be this timber product as CLT, cross laminated timber that we'll be discussing. And that representing a true uh, revolution uh, for uh, timber. So let's move this time with to a design example and starting with traditional timber architecture. I won't show you uh, Chinese architecture, but uh, more uh, um, Western architecture. Uh, I mentioned the staff Kirk uh, that was uh, produced and there's a very clever assembling of structural elements to produce this kind of building. And we have to learn a lot from this. Uh, indeed, in the terms of design, uh, you can have a look on what's appearing in Finland, that is a, a region in which timber is very widely used, and learn from this, you are protecting timber from the ground with uh, stone, you are protecting uh, the, 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 the highest part of the roof with timber, we have several elements that will be uh, uh, putting away the water from the element. You have places that could be replaced and this is uh, pro protected with strain. Uh, this is not a painting, but uh, a melange uh, in between the oil and the paint in this case. And there are parts that will be different that could be replaced and other that would be maintained. So that's a kind of uh, element. You can have very classical uh, architecture also. Uh, appearing with timber. Uh, this is not a stone at all, this is timber. And when I was uh, mentioning the fact that we can turn a system of, tone, of timber to stone for the appearance, the origin, 
for a certain uh, number of examples are still timber. So with this example here, you can see the plank on the facade. And you can see also that the assembling of architecture is also a way to protect specific zone of the building, uh, close to the roof, close to the ground, in the angle, and so on. And, and these are these examples that are speaking uh, from. Um, if you are going to timber bridges, uh, you have the system that's quite very old. So that's another example in painting of the Middle Age by Dürer, if you are known this time. And you can see here an efficient system using funicular but also protection of timber with a roof and also protection with kind of facade on both sides to avoid uh, the rain to go to the structure and to uh, to uh, make it uh, betting, uh, getting less, uh, less efficient with uh, the time. So this is another example coming from Switzerland. And what's very interesting is that you have a kind of lattice structure and this lattice structure with connection with uh, um, lowering uh, the length that could be buckling. So that's a very uh, uh, clever way to assemble uh, several elements. And we'll be discussing um, this kind of structure in the example that will be uh, following. Again, we'll see the role of the roof and the role of the facade. And in that case, the rain is not able to touch directly uh, the uh, structure. And that's uh, for uh, timber, uh, quite a clever version. And you know already this version ended. More timber design. And you can see that indeed, uh, what is uh, truly the structural part of the system is a very small part and the rest of this is just uh, designing something to protect what would be let's say the core of the structural uh, system. Uh, we mentioned the fact that we have to protect uh, the timber against uh, the contact with the crown since the earth, these are uh, worse condition for long-standing system. You can see a traditional version coming from the Chinese city Pinyao. And you have the uh, kind of uh, modern translation to this using a basement made of concrete with steel connection uh, and uh, the timber that's not uh, touching the ground. More uh, protective uh, assembling like this. So this is a part of the design in which we have to consider every contact with water that could be a problem uh, in the way you design the structure. And you have some example of this in which you have been avoiding the contact and using a steel connector uh, to take some distance with the ground. And also you have uh, the geometry in itself that can be useful. Sometimes you can use a protective uh, element. Here you have a thin layer of of, of uh, zinc and that is um, put on timber to protect what will be the fragile zone. Uh, this zone, when you have fiber appearing, is the worst indeed. And you can see in this example or in the example here where there are specific uh, sheets of metal plates that have been used to protect uh, the uh, global environment. You can see also the sheet of metal appearing here on the horizontal zone of timber. And that's a way to guarantee the long-standing character of timber. In this example, you see that the connection with the river is made with another material, and you have also protective element that will be uh, put on the structural system to protect it. Uh, and you have also uh, the fact that you have a kind of container on both sides that will be protecting the element in some part against uh, the rain. So that's a clever design in terms of durability. Some uh, contemporary example in architecture just to discuss what would be the strategies again finishing the system or protecting them. Uh, timber can be uh, something that is not appearing as timber. Uh, in some example, you can use a thin uh, element of timber of even uh, steel in the place you are not able to guarantee that you'll be that timber will be long standing. For example. And you can associate to timber screen made of cement, for example, 
to uh, raise the level of uh, performance of flaws that could be uh, met. You can protect it with panel that you can remove and replace, or you can protect it with kind of a cement of lime protection with timber. Uh, you see that the fact that uh, distance from the ground, distance from the roof and overhanging roof that will be protect the element that could in any case be replaced later. These are kind of strategy you can have. You can also have three different elements. We are in Switzerland here. The problem of uh, both Lager and Eberle or here back in Finland. And you can see small attentive connection with the roof, with the angle that would be uh, reinforced or with the contact with the ground in which you are trying to protect uh, timber uh, against what could be the risk in terms of long standing uh, of the structure in uh, itself. Well, other strategy we spent in this case with, I guess, were hanging a roof or this massive panel I was briefly showing here to guarantee that it will be long standing. In other case, this panel won't be able to resist a long uh, times. And you can see indeed that the appearance of timber could be very different according to the strategy we'll be uh, choosing. Against here, this part of the building is protect from the ground with a parking zone made of concrete and overhanging uh, roof system. But what is interesting in this building is that you have protective layer in red and uh, green uh, that are not quality wood, but that can be replaced a long time. And when you are too much exposed, you can just use another material to protect it in some places. And that could be a real strategy that would be defining your architecture. Uh, that's another example in uh, Finland that would be a massive timber development. So that is quite another uh, story. Um, well, um, Timber is the occasion to play also with light of waste material with a very uh, detailed uh, work that you can do with this. So very nice architecture mm -hmm. is not always massive architecture. And we have a lot to learn of this small pavilion uh, here is not uh, in France, but also here we are in Finland with the way that uh, this element have been assembled in terms of appearance and in terms of long standing for the system. So that these are very nice. Uh, example. Choosing for massive timber, you can do it only in several places. Here we are in Switzerland, where there are less moisture than other places in the world. And you have an example uh, in which we'll be using this massive uh, system. Here we are back in uh, Austria, in which you have a massive system that has been used with a question of uh, resisting water. You see that uh, timber is changing in appearance, but with very nice architecture. And you can see on the side uh, a traditional connection that will be reused uh, for this kind of uh, timber uh, construction. You can deploy imagination uh, to uh, devise what could be the system of timber and with properties that could be totally, be totally changing depending on the scale of the element you will uh, have or very uh, informed engineering approach in which you can take uh, the advantage of timber, timber to develop a very interesting uh, system on the long time. And with strategy on protective that are linked to timber, here you have uh, white uh, strains that have been applied to timber. You can see the uh, the uh, the soul, the uh, internal structure, but uh, you're still protecting the timber. Also, to say that a region in the world, for instance, here in Austria, uh, with the Vorarlberg uh, place, in which you are developing very interesting architecture made of timber, but using traditional way in the way. And also uh, that uh, timber could be a very technical material. I mentioned already several system against fire, water resistance and changing dimension. We didn't discuss about insulation, about controlling moisture into the building, about uh, connection, about managing uh, the uh, topics of um, the um, uh, acoustic that can be managed. So it drives to very technical approach and very technical detailing. And that's the part of the essence of timber. So having, let's have a, a word of CLT building. So CLT, as you know, are this kind of panel with crossed uh, 
direction of uh, timber and it drives very efficient system that could be a device as sheer walls made of uh, concrete. And that could drive very interesting uh, approaches in terms of uh, development and also specific design approach, as I mentioned also in the um, second lecture, if I'm not wrong about um, uh, um, Sterling time modeling into this kind of uh, model and also inventing a uh, structural system here with uh, folded plates. And that will be an example that uh, Silva will be presenting in the next uh, slides with what could be taken as advantage of this kind of material. Just a few words about uh, high rise timber building. Uh, one of the first was this one in 2009 in London was uh, seven layer, uh, seven stories of timber that were put of a classical um, concrete layer that could very speed the uh, the uh, the uh, construction. You need only a few uh, uh, a few uh, weeks for each story instead of, of weeks uh, for the whole building. And so this has been assembled very quickly and also having a very positive impact on the global warming potential of the uh, material. Just to show you what has been uh, developed with specific uh, jigsaw uh, connection between the walls and the, uh, the ground giving this appearance as a structure and you see the connection system that will be developed. But uh, at the end, you cannot see any timber in this building that has been protected by plaster board uh, at the end for fire uh, dimension. We have also a very uh, other, other approaches that can be followed for designing high-rise timber. And here, this is not linked to sheer walls, but to uh, let's say more classical, uh, post and beams uh, systems uh, driving to yet another kind of appearance in the building and with a specific attention to developing the bracing of the uh, system. And you can also go with, um, let's say, mixed or hybrid construction using steel column, for instance, with timber uh, flat uh, roof or using uh, uh, timber for the frames and columns and using a concrete slab, these connections are possible on a different scale of uh, building. To answer the question, what are the tallest building uh, in the world today? You can see here several examples of the top uh, five uh, elements with the highest building uh, made of timber is currently 86 uh, meter, uh, and that's uh, just uh, released in the uh, US. If I'm not wrong, was uh, Austrian um, design uh, office, but uh, I have to check this. Well, uh, just a few words about timber joint. Uh, timber joint uh, are contact joint or are using uh, steel connector. Uh, from this, uh, you have uh, different behavior against fire, as you know. You have to choose for this kind of uh, doors instead of uh, bolts that could be uh, um, exposed to fire. Here you are able to get uh, at the limit of timber or even to put some um, kind of uh, um, protective uh, element of uh, timber. And that will drive you the very complex uh, issue of designing this connection against fire, but also against forces in between a uh, connection made of steel and connection made of contact and joint. And what's important to mention about the global behavior is that according to the dimensioning and the uh, respective uh, dimension of the system, you can deploy it, uh, the utility, so plastic behavior of the connection are very, very low. And to uh, characterize this a lot, if you compare a, a connection that has been with glue. Uh, so this is strain stress deformation. So you have deformation here. Or if you compare to nails, you can see that nails could uh, develop very plastic behavior, but very fragile uh, behavior if you are using uh, glue uh, between members. 
and doors and bolts are in between. So you have to be attentive to this if you want to deploy a good structural behavior against uh, robustness. And more example of uh, this kind of connection. Now uh, let's have some short presentation of some timber structural system and I will be uh, giving the word to Silva just after this. Uh, the first stuff you have to say is to make your philosophy about what you are looking in terms of objective. If you are looking to material efficiency or if you are looking to redistribution for plastic design and redundancy in structure, if you want to follow up architectural constraints, if you want to dissipate energy against, for instance, uh, earthquakes, of if you want to guarantee fire safety, acoustic and carbon sink in your building, you have totally different philosophy of structure about this. If you want to guarantee fire safety, acoustic and carbon sink, you go to massive uh, timber construction with shivers of with bending uh, slabs made of CLT, for instance. If you have the problem of earthquake, you can go to traditional or uh, Japanese of Chinese architecture uh, or cobalt system, as you have seen the very first bridges in which you will be dissipating energy in the connection and not damaging the structure. If you have to go to architectural constraint, you have to need regular forms and then we go to frames or post and beam systems. If you try to look for a redundancy, you can have to uh, go to trusses, that is trusses, post and beam, or art system in which you can develop uh, several mechanisms into a system. But uh, going to material efficiency, this is more with bars and surface system. I won't be discussing surface system as vaulting and shell that's quite particular, but with bar is a fun system and a branching system, for instance, you will have several examples of that kind uh, that will be uh, put uh, forward. So uh, let's have a look on this as example. You remember I mentioned the dual rep representation between thrust analogy of bending system. Uh, you will see again this uh, kind of system with trust line, finite -like support, tree branching system appearing in the example I will be showing, and the example that uh, Silva will be showing inside of uh, VGS. And so here are some uh, true uh, study cases that are uh, really existing, starting first with arches and other slum uh, system. This is a kind of system that has been uh, developed with the Grubenman uh, brother that will be very inventive uh, in the uh, design. So here you have a kind of truss uh, in a roof integrating an arch and uh, also having the global dimension of a, of a truss, but with mechanism in which you can follow the arch into it. So you can invent this kind of very efficient uh, structural system. You can do the same with underslung system uh, using uh, tie bars and associating uh, steel with timber in this case of uh, bridges. So you can manage as well a system of uh, compression and tension system, but also a bending system in the gather here and the most to have several uh, different objective. So more you can be efficient and also guarantee some uh, redistribution of forces. Here are more examples coming from Wiehag, that is this uh, Austrian uh, design office. About tree branching system structure, of course, they are very efficient since you are making the timber working in compression instead of flexion. And all the system reveal very efficient for different kinds of structure and of bridges uh, with the Pont de Cré I mentioned already uh, before. You have also this counterpart in architecture with a center, uh, water center in the south of French. Uh, here you have kind of branching system that has been deployed. And a question arising from this is a question of connection uh, that have to be uh, developed inside the system to make it possible to run. And if the question of the course is linked to nodes, that could be uh, not a good approach if we have not a uh, very regular uh, system 
into your uh, connection. Of course, what's worked very well is changing material going to steel. And from this, of course, the same efficiency can be met, but steel is working also in uh, bending and timber is not that efficient. Going to truss and lattice truss timber, so again, the question of the connection will be uh, important to look at. And depending on this, uh, you can deploy the kind of more or less complex truss system. Uh, lattice systems are very interesting uh, since they are developing several load paths into the structure. And you have contemporary example in this with the example from Laurent uh, that is a Belgian uh, design office that's very famous uh, in Belgium, but also all around the world. With one of the first work here developing lattice truss, you can see again a very simple uh, truss system combined with a second truss system and each time you have a connection uh, you are just uh, uh, lowering the length that would be uh, uh, that could possibly be a buckling and that's a way to make a very kind of efficient uh, system in that uh, system uh, Silva will be analyzing this structure with uh, VGS in uh, some uh, minutes. About finite structure against the uh, Gruberman browser developed uh, this kind of system. You can see here uh, this kind of in, be in between uh, funicular and in between here a uh, fan like uh, system appearing at the support for this quite a long bridge with the original driving into this that's a way to go to the very long span with this kind of um, massive timber material and some specific uh, drawing made by john soul in this case and that's a very nice uh, uh, application that has been made by uh, York Konzet that I mentioned the first very first lecture about graphic statics. Um, and this fan system has been developed for efficiency uh, uh, for uh, timber. There's not that uh, much material that's been used with this very nice uh, timber uh, design. So uh, let's move to timber frameworks. Uh, we know that we have traditional frameworks that will be developing a lot of inventivity. Uh, and you see several example of this. We have to inspire of uh, this for the efficiency of our system. But we have also to have a look on frames that has been designed in Japan in which we have systems in everything is working in bending and in this case that won't be damaged by earthquakes and this kind of assembly can be reused also sometimes so that's kind of also a source of inspiration you have a kind of chinese counterpress of the wrist that's also dissipating um, uh, well uh, the energy of earthquakes and these are a very stable system that can last a lot of time and uh, a long time a short word about Corbel system that you mentioned already with the Chinese interpretation of this, with this kind of bridge that I'm just uh, finding uh, fascinating. It's, that's very nice to have the occasion to, to uh, uh, show the advantage of this kind of construction. Here we have a kind of uh, modern reinterpretation of that bridge uh, with a similar system. What about bending slab with CLT uh, panel? You know already this uh, system. You can develop a series of derivated uh, product, initial product that can be implemented in this kind of uh, structure that could be between bending and between plates and shear walls. And that's also something very uh, interesting with the potential we can develop in such a uh, structure. So it will be for me the end of this presentation and I will be offering the screen to my colleague Sylvain Rasner that will be presenting some uh, of this example uh, in an interactive way in VGS. Thank you, Denis. Well, uh, Philippe, can you just confirm how much time do we have? Yeah, take your time. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I just switch off the, the camera because I'm just in the middle of the French Alps, so the network is not okay. uh, of high quality.
Okay. So, um, the idea of this uh, last chapter of uh, the presentation of today is to present some explorations uh, of VGS, VGS, which is uh, vector-based graphic statics, uh, is a tool for informed and controlled uh, de design. Uh, as you you were um, uh, you were showed. Uh, last week by Jean-Philippe, it's not a form-finding tool. Um, it's uh, more or less an, an analysis tool. Uh, and we are convinced uh, with uh, Denis, Jean-Philippe, and uh, other teams of the, of the other members of the research team that uh, design of efficient structures and wood structures also uh, can be addressed uh, through manipulations of um, the structures with uh, the aid of a VGS. Uh, as a reminder of what you have uh, uh, seen with Jean-Philippe last week, VGS is a plugin for Rhino and Grasshopper, and you need to feed uh, the plugin with uh, some information. So the uh, curves, um, the curves which are the edges of the structures, you need to feed it also with the loads, uh, one, two, three uh, load cases. Uh, or more, and you need to feed it also with supports. And uh, the definition, the parameterization of the supports is very important because it uh, will uh, give you the, the possibility of an isostatic structure. And if the, the structure is isostatic, it will be easier to manipulate it uh, with VGS. If it's not isostatic, it's not a problem. You can uh, also use VGS, but uh, you will need to use the self-stress uh, box that you see here in the middle. And uh, it's a little bit more, let's say, complicated because you, you need to, to, to test the, the self-stress is possible to, to achieve the, the, the equilibrium of the structure. And then, as it is not a form-finding tool, um, you need to feed all that data, and uh, the, the plugin will evaluate equilibrium if it exists. So if it doesn't exist, you need to parameterize differently uh, the data to achieve the equilibrium. So once you have, um, let's say, succeed in an equilibrium at that step, it's uh, possible to um, manipulate the form and the force diagram that you will uh, that you that you see here on the right. All the um, definitions, let's say the visual representations and um, the um, the algorithmic uh, procedure. So let's begin with an elementary case with a strut and tie model. Uh, that Denis just uh, has been showing. Uh, it could be, for example, a beam in CLT because of the anisotropy of wood. Uh, it's quite interesting to use CLT. Uh, and uh, if we compute it with a Rhino, we, uh, we compute it with Rhino and we feed the data in the uh, Grasshopper plugin, VGS. So we find a form diagram and a force diagram on which we can uh, make some manipulations. And I will show you on the video. You can manipulate on the outer forces that you see in green. Um, and you can see, as a consequence, the reactions uh, on the structure. And you see that it's an, um, how do you say this? It's a, a real time procedure. Uh, you see all the consequence on the form of the form diagram and on the force diagram at the same time, and that's what it that's what uh, uh, is very interesting because you can design uh, with uh, more information on of the force diagram. You can design the form diagram, or uh, at the opposite, you can design the uh, force diagram with the information of the form diagram. So it's quite interesting to have the two reciprocal diagrams moving at the same time. You can also make some manipulations on the form itself. And here uh, you will see my mouse, maybe yes, uh, to, to try to make some manipulations on the, uh, on the portals of the truss and to make some uh, moves on the points 
uh, of the bars. And you see again the uh, let's say the, the 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 dynamic procedure between form force form and force diagrams. A little bit more complex structure is the uh, Koblenz uh, uh, viewpoint uh, that you, Denis uh, just presented uh, a few minutes ago. Um, this is um, a viewing platform uh, located on the on a hill in Germany. Uh, the structure is made of wood, and the, uh, the, there are posts of cord and steel, anchored in concrete foundations. Uh, the plan, um, the plan of the building represents a triangle defined by three different spans, and uh, the last set uh, of the those spans on the first ones, and the this peculiar plan, this closed form of the structure, make it possible to avoid bracing frames. That's uh, and that is uh, the let's say the, the 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 big picture of the building because it's very uh, peculiar for this reason. So this is a lattice timber truss system. Um, this is quite interesting because it's built and it's uh, both architectural and structural uh, project. The section is uh, the facade, let's say, and we can uh, process some analysis uh, with VGS. The species of the wood is Douglas, uh, very classic, and the spans are crossed by lattice girders. Uh, those lattice girders and are made of two layers of diagonals. And those two layers of diagonals, uh, just as Denny mentioned it, uh, made it possible to refine the sections and reduce the buckling length by holding them at the crossing, as you can see. And then we can uh, process the analysis with G VGS um, and have the uh, form diagram and the force uh, diagram. As it's a quite complex structure, um, we can manipulate it a little bit, but not so much uh, in uh, just one uh, single video. Uh, but uh, I can show you some manipulations on the outer forces. Um, maybe you can note that the outer forces are not represented uh, on the force diagram. Uh, it's one parameter of the VGS plugin. You don't need all the time to um, see all the elements uh, that uh, you can compute. So you see the, the explorations of intensity and directions uh, of the, the, the forces. And again, the, the, the computation of the reaction forces in consequence. Let's move to uh, a, a truss, not a lattice truss this time. Uh, so there are not connections in the middle of the of the um, of the diagonals. Uh, here there are cables uh, that are uh, that suspend the the bridge. This is the second version of uh, Traversiner uh, one. The Traversiner one uh, that is a bridge uh, uh, that uh, collapsed. Uh, uh, not collapsed, but was destroyed by falling. Uh, the engineer from Switzerland uh, built this second version. And uh, the only viable option uh, at the time appeared to be um, to, to move the bridge down the valley, uh, closer to the river, and further away from unstable uh, inner valley. So moving in that direction, um, Conzet uh, uh, so Conzet, uh, let's say, um, had to build this bridge in a very difficult site, where the north flank of the valley formed a very steep uh, vertical work face. So the most obvious solution for this location was the suspension bridge spanning around 100 meters. And uh, Conzet developed the idea of shortening the span of the bridge by making an angled walkway in the form of a long stair that we can see on the on this um, on this uh, section. This arrangement allow um, allow allow Conzet to use the, the the ribs of either side of the valley as natural pylons for a suspension bridge, and the bridge accommodates uh, two drastically different elevations. And at the end, the bridge acts as a massive cross-laminated timber staircase suspended with cables. 
So at the end, the span is um, of uh, 57 meters and not 100 meters with uh, this methodology. We can see um, the form and the forest diagram of uh, VGS. Um, and they decided to also, it's nice to mention that there is no anchor points, but more um, uh, concrete foundation on the right and the left uh, to avoid anchor points and the difficulties to maintain them in the uh, typical, typical Swiss uh, weather. So as uh, it's uh, quite a complex uh, structure also, uh, I just show you here some variations on the outer forces um, with the intensity and direction uh, moving. And you can see that we can uh, revert uh, the directions and discover uh, in this way, the student time model uh, inverted also. Another uh, example case study is uh, this uh, first uh, version of the Traverse Enough uh, Bridge. So um, this is the uh, bridge that um, was destroyed uh, by working falls. Uh, and um, this bridge connects um, uh, to, to uh, connects the, the, the both sides of a valley uh, with a span of 47 uh, meters and an inclination of 6%. Uh, um, what was very difficult with this bridge for Kanzet was uh, the self-weight of the uh, substructure, which was very limited because of the uh, helicopter available uh, for the construction. So the bridge is very light uh, and it's a very light 3D trench system with uh, paneled side rails acting as uh, stiffeners that you see on the, on the section. And the, the four sections that you see show the development of uh, the cross section of the bridge, mainly uh, the connection between the balustrade and the substructure. So the deck is uh, made of horizontal glue lamp beams and uh, suspended with steel cables. If we see at the analysis with VGS, uh, we can see the parabolic form uh, that gives an advantage because the diagonal members are almost stress-free under permanent load, making them easy to replace if it's uh, necessary uh, because of the weather uh, again in Switzerland. In this video, you can see a direct manipulation on the form diagram. Um, that reveals the complexity of this model because you see the uh, superposition of two submodels that I need to um, compute to um, uh, that I need to, to let's say uh, to manage to compute the hyperbolic structural model with uh, the diagonals in uh, two directions. So it shows you also, let's say, the limits of the tool that we are facing now and that we are trying now to overcome another uh, video to show that uh, the parametric models work well um, uh, nevertheless with variations on intensity and direction of forces acting on the uh, footbridge. Another, what, it was not this video. Okay, this is, this is the, the video with the, the variation on the, on the intensity and direction of forces uh, acting on the footbridge and in one direction and then on the opposite to see how the form diagram uh, just uh, adapt quickly uh, with these variations. Okay, so the idea of this uh, fifth uh, case study is to analyze a fan-like system for a simple structure uh, as this. This could be a CLT panel again. Uh, and if we analyze it with a VGS, uh, we can see how the bars in compression um, enables the efficiency of the load path. And again, the video shows the explorations, uh, variations on the acting forces and uh, evaluation of, uh, let's say that the variation on the acting, for acting forces uh, give some evaluation of efficiency uh, with the force diagram and the, the, 
the the size of the of the graphical uh, representation of forces. Again, the reaction forces and the uh, uh, and the acting forces, so the outer forces are not represented on the uh, force diagram, but you can uh, make uh, them appear with just a, a manipulation of VGS. Um, case 36, a tree branching system, that's quite maybe a more funny uh, uh, case uh, study. Uh, it looks like a spiral, and the definition uh, is made by Yushi Shen. Uh, just for us today uh, to uh, show the capabilities of VGS with uh, this kind of 3D structure uh, made of uh, compression ring uh, at the uh, top uh, and made of uh, bars in the tension to bring back the forces downward uh, uh, the structure. So we can uh, see the form diagram and uh, now we can see the force diagram uh, just a slide and make some uh, visualization of those two diagrams to show you how um, it is to just how easy it is to manipulate uh, let's say the structure and the diagrams in the uh, plugin and some manipulations i think no it's in this one there you see the manipulations on the tree branching system with some manipulation on the um, uh, direction forces and you will see also the manipulations on the uh, form diagram and on the position of um, of some points of the structure you can see at the same time on the force diagram that uh, uh, it adapts automatically uh, uh, from the form diagram. And you could uh, make some uh, manipulations also on the force diagrams, but obviously in this case of analysis is uh, more complex to make because it's very, um, uh, it's not, let's say, um, uh, obvious uh, the moves you can make on the force diagram to uh, make something uh, uh, quite good uh, on the form diagram. Designer always uh, prefer to uh, let's say, parameterize uh, the form diagram. Well, again, a structure that uh, Denis uh, just presented uh, uh, a few minutes ago, a house made of cross laminated timber panels. Uh, this is a, um, a single roof made of six gables roof. Uh, and this principle uh, of six gables roof combined enables the architect to offer uh, something like a free plan uh, because of the span, but at the same time, uh, very specific uh, sub uh, spaces uh, because of the, um, the uh, roof uh, that will stay um, uh, visible from inside. So this is quite a monolithic roof uh, seen as a folded, we can see uh, it as a folded structure uh, and we can parameterize it on a Rhino and make it uh, on it some analysis with VGS. You can uh, see that uh, it's quite a complex equilibrium that uh, made me some uh, um, adage to, to achieve, but um, the folded plates of CLT panels just appear in the analysis of VGS. We can see the ridges in tensions and uh, the panels with diagonals in compression uh, are the opposite uh, from a, a, um, a side uh, to the other side of the uh, building. And this is this was the first the form diagram. This is the force diagram uh, that uh, we can see in video also just to uh, perceive all the complexity in 3D space of this force diagram. And we can uh, make some direct manipulations uh, as it is an analysis. Uh, I'm not uh, showing uh, the form and the force diagram at the same time because it uh, doesn't worth it uh, because uh, it is built as it is. But you can see that we can manipulate uh, on the force diagram quite easily. Uh, in the limits of the parameterization uh, of the VGS. Okay, 
another case study, a little bit more specific, uh, because it is extracted from a research by design that we made with uh, Denis and Jean-Philippe with uh, uh, some groups of students. The topic was an addition to the uh, Queen Elizabeth Music Chapel in Brussels, uh, which is, uh, let's say, a center of excellence uh, for artistic training um, with an international uh, dimension uh, uh, in the music um, uh, industry. Uh, and among uh, diverse buildings to design, they had to uh, draw a concert hall. And the structure of this main hall had to be integrated into the design process by the students from the beginning. Um, so their task was to design, size, and draw uh, this, uh, their wooden structure. And this is the perfect task, uh, obviously, for VGS and some extension, let's say, on parametric modeling that you can see, because VGS is just the uh, box uh, on the right of your screen. The other boxes are the, um, let's say, geometric definition of um, one uh, of the uh, results uh, of this uh, research task. So uh, as a first result, you can see a folded roof made of CLT panels. Uh, let's say same but different from Atlanta because from the house of Atlanta that we have seen with the six gabled roofs, uh, because uh, it's folded, it can be seen as a folded structure, but it's very more uh, systematic. Um, and you can see the uh, 3D model, uh, the, the form diagram uh, of one piece of the roof, uh, very complex also to, man to, to create and manipulate, uh, but uh, it works, it's a full 3D uh, model and you can uh, see how uh, the form diagram is in 3D. And at the same time, we can see uh, the uh, force diagram, uh, which uh, reveals uh, behavior uh, almost in 2D. Uh, it was one of the difficulties of those students to um, let's say, uh, solicited uh, at the best all the bars of the truss. And uh, other results um, of this exercise show diversity of structural models that reflect um, different approaches in the definition of the building. Um, uh, as they had to, to make it a wall of architectural and structural projects. You know, they had to, to, to make a project um, yes, as a wall uh, with the architectural side and the structural side. So they had to, um, you know, to, to, to manage um, uh, each group uh, uh, a special procedure to make it uh, happen uh, at the same time. And uh, they are so, so this is the explanation of the diversity uh, of the results. Um, some groups use the superposition of 2D diagrams of form and forces. And this principle was used to manage the different loading cases. Um, again, in this, uh, in this uh, case, and um, not in this one where we can see uh, an interesting truss structure uh, in glue lamb. We can make also some uh, explorations of the outer forces uh, in 2D, as you can see uh, here below. Um, and what's interesting uh, next, it's that uh, VGS, if I can make a little bit acceleration. Well, what uh, VGS, uh, what, what I want to, to show you here is that VGS VGS allows uh, also for a comparative analysis of the values of forces in the bars of the uh, stratum tie uh, model. And uh, this can be node by node, you can see uh, again, node by node using the vector-based approach of VGS. And then we can uh, isolate some uh, node and uh, isolate the values of the forces in this uh, node. Eventually, based on graphic statics diagram, uh, timber joints can be designed according to applied forces. Uh, 
because of uh, this capability of the software. This led uh, the obviously uh, so we were lost your voice I think we lost a uh, survey and maybe he will come back very soon. It, it seems indeed that we, we lost him. <laughs> yeah, I think he is, he is coming back, should be. So, any question from the students is welcome. You can think about that after. Okay, go back. <laughs> okay, again. Sorry, my connection is just so poor. Um, well, but I, <coughs> I had just some slides, some more yeah. slide, but uh, we can just uh, end with uh, this one and a second one, maybe. Denis, you you can confirm that you can hear me, Denis or Philip? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, I was here with this particular assembly, um, just showing that um, VGS can be used to inform the designer about the transmission of forces. And uh, that's uh, very interesting uh, because the purpose is to promote the direct transmission of forces between elements. So it si can be Oh, alors effectivement, c'est un peu blanc. Wait, I'm going to share it again. Okay, now can you see my screen also? Oui, normalement, okay, okay, perfect. So uh, the video just uh, shows the uh, manipulation of the form diagram uh, just plotted uh, on, um, a particular, on, on this particular assembly. And uh, it shows, I think that VGS can, used to, can be used to inform the designer about the transmission of forces uh, in uh, this node. And um, you can see that it's quite uh, direct between the form diagram and the force diagram uh, explorations. And uh, you can just uh, make it on Rhino. And at the end, it, it shows some bug uh, also because it's not always so easy. You see, up when I um, pick some point that, uh, that um, let's say, depends on parameters that I, uh, that I put in the uh, Rhino definition, uh, it can uh, provoke some limits of the tool. And uh, just to uh, to 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 end uh, some other uh, examples uh, of joints, but that can maybe uh, um, uh, maybe uh, they can uh, uh, show some pitfalls as uh, an inadequate bearing surface or or difficulty in the management of different loading case. So those are examples of other students, but the, uh, that show some limits uh, in this very uh, difficult exercise. 
uh, of uh, uh, timber to timber uh, joints. And um, such an exercise, so as I just said, is very complex, uh, but uh, it can very well be informed with the use of VGS that you can see on those two videos at the same time now. Uh, where we can see how the VGS plugin can help the designer to balance the forces uh, to manage the different loads or to check the adequation of a bearing uh, surface. Yeah. Well, uh, I think it can be the end. I hope those explorations, those case studies show you how VGS can be used uh, as a tool for, for controlled and informed design of a timber structure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Again, sorry for the, for the poor connection. No problem. Okay, I think it's uh, quite in, um, interesting, the VGS. Uh, we can have further understanding for that. Uh, I find VGS is more easily or more accurately compared to polyframe, uh, which developed by, um, uh, by Mansat from UPenn. Because last year we have a joint um, uh, studio, so we compare. Uh, we, we we don't have a very deep knowledge about the VGS, but we, in the future, I'm looking forward based on our uh, collaboration, Dennis. We can. We can understand it more deeply on the VGS, uh, but I find it's it's quite um, interesting. The VGS actually control more uh, uh, precisely for the joints, not only the joints, but also the process of the components or uh, uh, all the joints, uh, uh, bars, and uh, everything could be very accurately controlled. But at the same time, uh, because of the the form diagram, force diagram is more difficult uh, for. Uh, for the student and the users to understand. So that maybe need time to test it um, uh, through the process, uh, how the users can, can control this, this tool. So uh, I would like to invite uh, my student um, uh, because we have some, 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 some uh, postdoctor and, uh, and the PhD candidates, they, they also research on this topic. So would you like to put forward any question from the floor uh, to, Dennis and uh, and, uh, and Sovin. Yes. Yes, I have one question. Mm. Yes, I have one question. Uh, and thanks for the for your lectures. And I, I noticed that uh, at the beginning of the lecture, um, Professor Dennis uh, mentioned that. Um, the bending is more efficient when it matches the uh, the direction of the fiber, and uh, um, it it and followed by compression and tension. I noticed that uh, in the example, uh, and um, may, most of the components are in actually a compression and tension, and uh, uh, others some some uh, uh, some of some of of the components are in bending so so i i i was uh i want to know and how do i consider this issue in the design process because uh because bending is more efficient and uh, um, compression tension is not so uh, not so efficient um than the bending and and, and also i realized that vga is VGS um, in the design process may mainly analyze the type of uh, compression or uh, tension, but but it I I I I think maybe it is it can be used in in bending uh, or uh, I, I don't know I don't know how to um, yes and no, no, it's, I, it's I just clear. want to know that how it is used in bending in this situation. Okay, that's clear. Um, so first, for the question, is, is compression or bending more efficient? 
the fact is uh, clearly uh, bending is not the most efficient. Uh, in compression or tension, you have to all the fiber that's working the same uh, current level. But the problem is when you bend the structure, uh, you have a kind of a fiber that are glued to the adjacent fiber that could redistribute force and that could bring the fiber to work at a higher level and not 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 being uh, uh, as a consequence uh, suffering for uh, the the defect that are existing in the timber. So at, at the scale of the material, that's the answer: is that you can go to uh, higher. Uh, tension or compression force due to bending since all the fiber are not at the maximum. Uh, and that's, that's the key of the answer. As soon as you are solicited all the bars in tension or in compression only, you have to lower to, to middle the, 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 the rate to which you are able to, uh, to uh, put the, the, the fiber working. Um, but uh, the the so so that's just for the difference of force you can have at the local uh, element. But as soon as you are um, uh, thinking at the scale of the whole uh, element, bending will uh, drive to have deformation that you are not able to control. If you are just uh, compression or tension force, yeah, you have very few deformation and the structure is very more efficient. And this is why I, 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 I try to gather a series of examples in which you are not relying of, on bending uh, to just to go to maximum efficiency of the structural system. But also, if you remember this kind of table I showed about the several approach, uh, depending on what you are seeking as an objective in your structural design, you have to go sometime to bending or to something else as corbel system or piling uh, element for uh, the, the the question for earthquake for instance the fact is that as soon as you have uh, uh, triangulated systems they are very efficient but they are also uh, they could be fragile if if you if they suffer to to uh, solicitation as earthquake the fact is that in belgium we have nearly no earthquake china is a wide uh, country in which we have several uh, uh, several scenario that could appear in some time you have an earthquake and on the others not. So from this, you have each time to make your mind about the direction you want to go and what could be uh, the, the, the decisive element of design that will be enabled to design to the, 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 the kind of structural system you want to deploy. So uh, most of the time, that's the answer. About um, VGS and bending, so you remember that uh, the funicular polygon is just showing what's happening. So the, the, this kind of curve, it's showing what's happening in bending, but uh, that's just a way to represent the problem. You can choose to just go to student time modeling or just you, you can choose to just go to the, let's say the classical theory in which you have bending, shear force and so on. And that's, that's, uh, that's what I put forward also that you have already choose to take one or the other approaches. And of course, VGS don't manage bending, but you have to choose on the model and you can model a beam as a stress system, or you can model a beam as the association of the, the of a trust of an arch uh, bars and a tension bar or a diverse as a funicular bar with a compression strut. You can always choose your model. So that's not an issue for VGS. It's just an issue for your habits in looking to a problem, and we discussed this already last uh, week about it is kind of complexity we are not used to. But if you have to learn about the classic elastic theory, that's also a kind of uh, learning you have to do to be able to manage it. It's, it's just a different system. And if you are going uh, to listen to our colleague Joseph Schwartz, he would say uh, bending is not existing at all. It's it's not it's not it's not true. You just have tension and compression. If you're looking to the stress, indeed you have just compression or tension. So that's another way to look at, at structural problem. And indeed, VGS is in this new way that is linked to a serious stuff about indeed 3D graphic statics, about uh, student time modeling, about plastic design, about all the series of elements that I put forward in this series of lecture to make it consistently about what was the vision of the structure. So uh, I hope that the, 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 the difference between the, the local stress is, is clear. It's the same in concrete. In concrete, you have 
higher level and you have to limit only uh, compression forces uh, as you have column, that's exactly the same. Uh, so that's not truly relevant about this, but indeed compression is just more efficient, but it could be also more fragile depending on the circumstance of uh, you are using them. So that's an interesting question about the structural design. Great. Yes, I think uh, it's an interesting uh, question and the answer is, is really, we need time to, to uh, understand more deeply about uh, the VGS. Actually, Dennis, in my team, actually we're doing a lot of one-to-one um, uh, -one scale mock-up research. I think in terms of um, the complexity uh, of the VGS uh, tools, uh, uh, I think we should plan maybe to do different kind of different scale test uh, mm -hmm. in the future, maybe maybe uh, from a very small bridge uh, to larger scale and to real uh, scenarios, real project, real pre pavilions. Uh, it's, it's, we have time, we have three years to, to understand. Sure. <laughs> I think it's a really good um, uh, two box and uh, VGS, you already achieve a lot and uh, based on this fundamental uh, uh, two set. I think in the future, I think we, because we have very strong um, uh, robotic fabrication uh, infrastructure system here, and uh, that will help us to test different scenarios. Uh, uh, especially the, the timber structure is, is really good to, 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 to test this kind of bar or compression uh, uh, system, compression tension system uh, in uh, the timber structures uh, uh, buildings. So uh, you, I think it's a, it's a it's a great opportunity to have you uh, give us uh, Dennis and your team give us three uh, wonderful uh, uh, lectures. Uh, in the future, I think uh, we should have more uh, uh, collaboration, including teaching. Uh, I would like to invite your team, maybe uh, uh, teaching not only in the workshop, uh, the summer school workshop, but also could be the studio. And uh, you have, um, uh, you're welcome to, uh, to to travel to China, maybe for a semester or, and then bring your student here. I think I will also invite you to traveling to see some timber uh, uh, projects, uh, wonderful bridges you mentioned in the different uh, countryside uh, of, of China, beautiful countryside. And uh, uh, although it's hundreds of years, but we still have a wonderful timber project in China, including the, the tower, including the, the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty uh, temples. I think the, the joints, uh, uh, Dogong joints, are extremely beautiful. And uh, we need uh, people to research on that uh, for the earthquake, for the timber structure joints, and also a lot of um, problems, uh, a lot of scenarios. We have an opportunity to, to make research together in the future. So um, any other questions? Because this is the, the last uh, lecture this semester uh, Dennis gave us. Uh, you're welcome uh, to, to, to put forward any questions uh, from you. Yes. Hi, Dennis. Can you, can you hear me? Hi. Okay. I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so thank you for your very um, professional and systematic lecture. And I'm really inspired by your uh, initial research about the timber as a, since it is a very traditional material. And until now, we know, we, we all know we have to uh, innovate some of the different use and different uh, composited use of this kind of material. I just have one question about this material. I just would like to to ask, um, considering some of the um, structural performance of this material, and since it is a biological material, I wonder how can we explore timber in the perspective of material recycling and reuse, as well as its potential for combination with other biomaterials? <clears throat> Okay, so thank you for this question. That's a very nice question indeed. Uh, I, I think that uh, you so you know maybe the um, uh, analyze uh, the cyclic influential the, the life cycle analysis. That's that's a true question in which we are attentive to, and the problem is that uh, indeed uh, that's a biological material. But as soon as you are treating it, it's not anymore biological material. So the end of life uh, of the system is quite uh, important. And as you, as you have seen, uh, the, the properties in the same scenario as, as a drowning, as uh, getting lower 
uh, with with the time. But normally, if you are changing the, the way the structure is assembled, it's a way of uh, re reinitiate it uh, again. And so, um, and so about this, uh, that's a true stake since uh, what do you need for every structural system to be reused? It can be reused in place or it can be reused after dismantling and rebuilding with the material. And so which are the conditions uh, we need for assuring that it could be reusing without being damaged? And that's uh, another, totally another way to, to, to design a structure um, and um, to, to disassemble it. And uh, indeed, uh, I hope that in the framework of the, the pavilion you have to, to design, we'll be able to think through to this question or what could be a selection of timber you can uh, dismantle and reassemble. Uh, in the classical architecture with the example I mentioned, it is very frequently that uh, structures have been disassembled and have been combined in another way. So if they could do it centuries ago, uh, so three to four centuries ago, why, why are, are we not able to do it right now? So that's a true question about design. And I think that's a true architectural problem. So it's a question about manufacturing, assembling and testing and so on. But it's a question of an architect. And today the architects are not trained to ask this kind of question. And I hope that uh, with the experience you have, the experience we can have with the help is history and the help of tests, we can make our minds about what should be a structure to be uh, fully reused at the end. Reuse could be also for timber just burnt, but if we have a chemical into it, it cannot be burned domestically. So that's a true question. And uh, the, the first thing in this series is to know very, very well uh, the use of material to have no problem with water and with fire. As this can be achieved, we can discuss about recycling structure. If that cannot be achieved, your structure will be damaged along the time and everything is ends at, at that stage. So um, that's, that's a research for engineer uh, for structural system, but that's also a research for architect. And the architect have to uh, master all this, uh, this, uh, this uh, series. Just for the history, uh, we have at uh, the school, uh, one year just training about timber and there are kind of other training. So for people having their diploma ready, they are to be trained more and more about design, uh, timber design. You can do it without this design, but if you do it without it, you are making just mistake and there are a lot of mistake possible in timber. So about the perspective of one day being able to just reuse uh, forever the same timber component, uh, that's just fascinating. Maybe we, we can repair also with plug of timber that can be adapted to, to existing uh, element. The question is, is cost. Uh, if the cost remain the same, maybe it's not that interesting. But if you see the properties of old timber that were just exceptional, uh, you can always reuse them. So that's a kind of uh, thinking we are not used to have about reusing this this uh, structure, but I would like personally very enter this in this topic of of design for reusing with timber with 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 efficient structural timber, and that's indeed a, a fascinating fascinating uh, topics. Uh, sure, uh, stakes. Sure, I'm not sure I answered the question. Just tell me if this is if this is one not clear about this. Yes, thank you very much. I think you just point out a different perspective of my question. It's not just, uh, you know, to innovate the new material, but it's a problem of design of the structural efficiency design. Maybe I can study it later. <laughs> Thank you very much. And there are, there are specific materials, condensed timber, and there are biological odor material that could be associated, but that's yet another problem. And I'm not skilled on this. I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on, on design so that's 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 our approach yes thank you very much thank you today actually uh dennis uh, make a very uh, detailed introduction to the materiality of timber i think uh, this is fundamental knowledge we need to uh, learn we need to make research in the future actually gary is developing the robot uh, two robotic teams actually we have like uh, 16 uh, axes uh 
uh, two robotic uh, on the track and can collaborate in manufacture uh, the very big pieces in, in Shanghai. So Gary is a developer for this uh, robotic system who is right now the PhD, PhD candidate. So in the future, he, he is also in, inside the team. And Xinjie, Zhou, uh, uh, he is actually making research on the graphic statics uh, and also achieve um, graphic statics in the timber structure. So he, he will also be one of the chief um, uh, uh, PhD researchers in this uh, collaborative team. So in the future, I think uh, we, we, we should have a lot uh, to learning from your team. And also we want to uh, sharing our uh, infrastructure system and sharing our different research scenarios with you. And uh, looking forward next week, we'll have a special uh, 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 meeting to kick off the joint research. Mm -hmm. uh, where uh, we should make uh, prepare for some plan and a schedule and research plan and how to uh, 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 res uh, make different progress based on the collaboration of the pavilion research or the uh, mock-up research or the including uh, we, we we can exchange uh, uh, the PhD students uh, to each team and to learning from each other. So, so that's a great opportunity to have you here and looking forward, Dennis, you can travel in more often to Shanghai in the near future. Okay, thank you so much for the fantastic uh, blind mo uh, blowing uh, three fantastic lectures and your team are fantastic. So uh, thank you uh, for, for, for your uh, uh, coming and uh, uh, see you next week, Dennis. So, so thank you very much for uh, this. Uh, thank you so see you next week. Okay, thank you. Sweet. Thank you, uh, Sylvain. Bye. Great, great. See you next week. Yeah. Bye. Hey, bye-bye.